everybody here today, especially those who uh, are here for the first time. So if you're a visitor today, we'd like to ask you, if you would, there's a little insert into the bulletin. If you wouldn't mind filling that out and dropping it in the offering plate, that way we'll have a record of, uh, of your visit with us today. and hope you'll come back. Uh, we have just a few amount announcements. The Pearls are collecting uh, zip, uh, flip top, <laughs> ball top, ball top and uh, goods and the view. And that's one where uh, you can just fill open with the top, with that top top. Top top, you don't have to use can of So, and those will be going on until it wins. Anybody know? Uh, we'll collect it for win. I just want to hear you try to say pop top again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Those will be going on until for a couple of weeks. All right. Um, we're continuing our study in the book of Mark uh, on Wednesday nights. We'd like to invite everybody to come. Uh, if you'd like to come to the potluck, that's at 6 o'clock, and the Bible study is at 6.45. We're studying the book of Mark and having a great time, so we'd like to invite you to that. Um, if you have any needs this week or I need to get in contact with anybody and contact me. Members there are Brother Danny or any of the deacons or actually anybody uh, in the church here and they'll get the word to us. Uh, we've got a lot of birthdays this month, so happy birthday to all those people in the bulletin. And two, a couple things we just want to remind people about. Uh, coming up October 29th will be our uh, trick or treat, trunk or treat here in the, uh, in the outside of the parking lot. Uh, We'll have, on November 14th, we'll have Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes. That begins then. And, uh, okay, and then November 22nd, our Senior Thanksgiving Dinner. Uh, we should be back here in Kirby Hall. Everybody's invited to that. All right. Anybody? Yeah. Uh, a word of announcement. October 19th is a Wednesday. Uh, and that is our Family Fall Fest. Uh, for those of you that have been around Plano for a while, uh, it's what we used to call the Hobo Festival. Okay. Uh, and so come on out to that. It'll be from 6 to 8. Uh, and uh, bring a canned food item with the label off. Uh, just trust me. <laughs> and if that one doesn't have to have a pop top on it. But I told you I was going to get you to say it again. <laughs> But anyway, uh, it'll just be an evening full of uh, fun and, and family fellowship and, and good food. So come on out and be a part of it. All right. And that's, uh, that's Wednesday, October 19th. 19th. All right. Any other announcements? Yes. Jennifer Allison and uh, Pat Farley are on there for the They're both the areas here. They're the ones that have been here. Joe Ross and Pam. Joe Ross and Pam Farley. Oh. Is that why Joe's there as well? Because of a high temperature? Yeah. Also, not on our part of this, will be next week. Uh, Melba Hale's sister found her son being in the apartment. She was 42 years old. And the Wade family has to be away. Melba Hale passed away this week, 64 years old. That's a Remember all those?
Good morning, church. Welcome, welcome to Plano Baptist Church. Uh, it's good to see all of you. Some of you haven't been here in a while. It's good to see Joy back in service. I guess it's good to see Anthony back in service, too. <laughs> I, I guess you guys are kind of a pair and we have to take both of you. Okay, well, it's good to see both of you then. <laughs> you can't drive on your own yet. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. It is a blessing to have each and every one of you. For those of you watching online later, for those of you who might not know who I am, my name is Danny Pace. I'm the pastor here at Plano, and I just want to thank you for being here with us today, uh, especially if you're a guest. If you're a guest and this is your first time visiting with us, we're grateful to have you, and I pray that you are blessed by today's, uh, today's service. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Uh, today we are in the Gospel of John. We're in the Gospel of John chapter 6 to be specific. John chapter 6. Uh, I know that we were in John last week, but this uh, morning's message isn't really meant to tie in to last week's message at all. It just so happened that looking at today's service, I thought that this passage would, would fit nicely uh, with today's service, which is Communion Sunday, uh, which we'll be observing a little bit later, Communion uh, together. So if you have your Bibles and you have found it, we are in John chapter 6. We're we're going to be reading uh, beginning with verse 25, beginning with verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs that I performed, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. And then they asked him, well, what must we do to, to do the works that God requires? Jesus answered, the works of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, well, what sign will you give that we might see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. But Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. And at this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said that I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say that I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard the Father and learned from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. And very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in him has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and yet they died. But here, here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. And whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Pray with me, church. Father, I can relate to these people in this congregation this day when Jesus was giving this word. Father, I can relate to them as they were confused and as they were sometimes argumentative and just couldn't wrap their minds around what Jesus was saying. Father God, I pray, Lord, that those who might feel the same way, that you might enlighten us today. 
This passage could be confusing, but it really isn't. It's simply Jesus saying that he has come to die for our sins. That he has come to offer up his body as a sacrifice and to pour his blood out on a cross for our sin. It's as simple as that. But just as the crowd had a hard time understanding back then, Father God, I, I know that there are those of us in this room who have a hard time understanding it today. And so I pray, Lord, that you would just open our eyes and our hearts. For those who don't know you today, God, I pray that this sermon might be a sermon that allows them to see through all of the jargon and the words that get thrown around this passage to understand the heart of what Jesus is saying, that he is offering himself He's offering himself for our salvation. And I pray, Lord, that those of us who have partaken of that sacrifice, Father, that we would be reminded of it, particularly today as we take communion, that we would be reminded of the great sacrifice that he paid on the cross for our sin. But for those who don't know you this morning, God, I pray that this message might be the spark that the Holy Spirit uses to draw them in and, and to woo them and to convict them of their sin and their need of a Savior. Father God, speak to us in your word today. Speak to us through this ancient message that Jesus proclaimed. I pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, the day that we just read about actually uh, happens right after an encounter that takes place in the chapter before. It's a very well-known encounter that most of you have probably heard before. Jesus has just fed the night before 5,000 people, miraculously fed 5,000 people. And for those who have been coming on Wednesday nights, we actually covered this passage not too terribly long ago in the Gospel of Mark. And, and so you know when, when the scriptures say 5,000 people, that in Bible Bible times, uh, typically only the heads of households were counted in these large crowd gatherings. They couldn't count everybody, so they would just kind of count clusters of families. And so when it says 5,000, it's probably referring to just the men or the heads of the household. So there could have been double, possibly even triple the amount of people fed that day. And it was a miracle. It was a miracle, and it pains me to have to actually stress that. And I stress it this morning not because we live in a skeptical world, which we do. I stress that this morning because I encounter more and more Christians who have a hard time believing the miracles of the New Testament. They doubt that some of those things ever existed. There are Christians who have a hard time believing that Jesus fed anybody that day. And if that's you hear me out. I want to offer you five rebuttals very quickly. Number one, you have a faulty view of God. If you can't believe this miracle, you have a faulty view of God. And I'll, I'll tell you why. It's because your understanding of God is too small. It's too small. Surely the God who created the cosmos, who created man, who, who had the power to raise Christ from the dead, can feed a few thousand people on a hillside. Seriously, our entire faith system is built around the premise that, that Christ died and was raised from the grave. That is the whole basis of Christianity. And if you can believe that, but you draw the line at Jesus feeding a miraculous picnic, <laughs> something's wrong. Which leads us to point number two. This picnic was a big deal. It was a big deal. Uh, why do I say that? Because other than Jesus' resurrection, this is the only miracle that shows up in all four gospel accounts. In other words, people remembered it. People left talking about it. Number three, there wasn't any disagreement. There wasn't any disagreement. Uh, no one in this first century denied this story. Think about that. Uh, wouldn't at least one of these 5,000 people, actually, wouldn't at least half of the crowd that day have spoken up if this story was not legit? If this never happened, don't you think at least half of that group of people would stand up and say, actually, I was there and that didn't happen. Let me set the record straight. But as it is, we have no evidence 
that anyone denied the story. Quite the, contrary, quite the contrary, we have every reason to believe they all saw it and believed it. Number four, the Messiah had come. This miracle was such a big deal and it impacted people with such, such power that they began to wonder after this event if Jesus Christ was indeed the Messiah. Verse 14, it says, After the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who is come into the world. And they use prophet with a capital P. That capital P translates, they believe that this was the promised Messiah. The miracle feeding of the 5,000 led people to believe that perhaps the Messiah had come and was in their midst. And lastly, they asked him to do it again. They asked him to do it again. And this brings us to our passage that we read earlier, the passage at hand. This crowd wanted Jesus to do the trick again. Have you ever seen somebody do a magic trick and you were just so amazed at it and the first thing you said was, do it again. This crowd said, do it again. Not only did they ask for him to do it again, but they tracked him all through the night. And where we picked up in verse 25 is when they find him the following morning. And they ask him, do it again. And Jesus answered, you're just here looking for another meal. In other words, these people had saw a miracle and they wanted another one for breakfast. Literally. It was a miracle. They believed that they were in the presence of the promised Messiah prophet and they wanted more. More of the experience. More of his time. More food. More miracles. They wanted more of the show. As if the Messiah's sole purpose on earth was to perform for them to entertain and that is where the crowd starts to look an awful lot like us sometimes sometimes if we're being honest we we have to understand that we're only interested in following God as long as God performs for us as long as God provides for us, as long as God does what we want, as long as God feeds our bellies. In this crowd, we're looking for their bellies to be filled. And metaphorically speaking, we are no different. We're no different. Sometimes we can chase after the idea of a fast food God, a God who will satisfy our appetites, deliver on time, and do it with a smile. But that God doesn't exist. That God doesn't change lives. That kind of God is just another product to be consumed. And oftentimes in our consumeristic culture, that's the kind of God that we want. And maybe, just maybe, that's the reason so many people have decided that that kind of God isn't worth their time. Today's verses are powerful. They're beautiful and they're true. Jesus Jesus walks his listeners through the good news of the gospel. He like completely just lays it out there. There's some riddle in there with the whole thing about blood and and body and flesh. and And the people aren't quite understanding. But this is perhaps the most clear that he's ever been with a large group of people before. And he speaks to them like he's speaking to us today. Look again with me, verses 26 and 27. And Jesus answered them, I tell you the truth. You are looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and you had your fill. 
do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Jesus challenges our motivations. Jesus challenges our motivations. What do I mean by that? You have to understand that the people here in chapter 6 were chasing after the wrong things. Specifically, they wanted more food. The struggle's real, amen? (laughs) Just me? All right, I'll take it. And Jesus calls them out on it. Jesus says to them, you're so focused on getting another meal that you have completely forgotten, completely overlooked the work of God that was attached to that miracle, that was attached to that meal. In other words, you're missing the point, he says to them. And he goes on and he says, don't wish for food that will spoil, but wish for food that leads to life. Jesus here isn't talking about food anymore, not real food, not physical food. He's now beginning to talk about chasing things that don't truly matter, things that don't satisfy, things that don't last. They're pursuits that we might find happiness in for a moment, but they leave us empty in the long run because they possess no eternal value. It's just a quick meal and it's gone. Jesus says, stop chasing after food that will spoil. And listen, it doesn't matter whether your pursuits are noble or sinful. It doesn't matter. They are going to spoil if the pursuit isn't Jesus. It's the difference between setting our hearts and minds on the things of this world or setting our hearts and minds on the things of God. It's choosing a life that is motivated by a hunger and a thirst for Jesus. For Jesus. Perhaps you've spent your entire life chasing after things that have left you empty. And you find yourself asking Questions that the crowd were asking that day. Questions similar to the one they asked right after this. So how much is this the eternal life thing going to cost me? I'm not making it up. It's right here. Pick up at verse 28. And then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? That's the uh, what's this going to cost us part. And Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Jesus challenges our expectations. He challenges our expectations. Let me explain. See, the Jewish people were driven by a a works-based theology. What did that mean? It, it, It means that they believed God's favor was based upon their own merit, that you had to earn your salvation. And so they expected that there had to be something they had to do, some work that they had to perform in order to receive this life that Jesus was talking about, in order to receive this bread of life that he was talking about. Well, well, what do we need to do then, they ask him. And even today, this idea persists. It runs rampant, even in the church. I run into people all the time who who believe that they are beyond God's forgiveness because of something that they've done. Or, or, Or people who believe that God will love them more if they work harder and are more righteous. Or sometimes I encounter people who believe there are other people that God could never love, could never forgive because of something they have done. And it's all the same sentiment. This belief that salvation is based on what we do. But salvation is by faith. It is through grace. It is freely given. It is freely received. And Jesus said to them, the the work? (laughs) The work of God is this. Believe in me. He says. Sounds too good to be true. 
Sounds like when you're walking through Sam's Club on Saturday and they say, you want a free sample? And you're like, well... Although if you plan that out right, you can get an entire meal at Sam's Club on a Saturday. <laughs> there are way too many of you to know what I'm talking about. It sounds too good to be true. Which is why some of the people in the crowd, and maybe even you, hesitate to believe it. Some of you work so hard at being the good, faithful Christian person. And I'm not saying that pursuit of holiness and righteousness is wrong. It's called for. But you're missing the point. If you believe that there are people who can't come to know Jesus because of something they've done, you're missing the point. If you believe that Jesus can't save you and transform you because of something you did, you're missing the point. Jesus said to them, the work? Believe in me. Believe in me. So they respond. Give us a sign. <laughs> Picking up where we left off, verse 30. And so they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give so that we might see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. And as it was written, he gave them bread from heaven. And Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus challenges our motivations. Jesus challenges our expectations. And Jesus challenges our hesitations. Jesus challenges our hesitations. The crowd said, give us another miracle and then we will believe you. <laughs> and they shift the conversation toward a story from the Old Testament involving Moses and the children of Israel. It's, it's book of Exodus stuff, right? Back in the book of Exodus, the Israelites demand that Moses give them a sign to prove that God will take care of them in the wilderness. And so Moses prays and bread rains down from heaven. And they call this bread manna. Manna. I like to think of it as Krispy Kreme donuts, but I think I'm reading into that translation. Amen. I hear an amen. I heard an amen. Jesus' listeners say to him, so give us a sign like Moses. Man, they're really stuck on that food thing. I say that, and I've also brought up food several times in this message. <laughs> it wasn't Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, Jesus said. It was my father, the one who gives you the true bread from heaven. And he comes down from heaven to give life to the world. It's like Jesus was saying to them, you keep looking for signs and for miracles when the only sign that you're ever going to need is standing right here in front of you. The bread of life, which gives life to the world, to you, to me. It's Jesus who realigns our motivations. It's Jesus who confronts our expectations. It's Jesus who silences our fears and our hesitations. And so the crowd begged Jesus, Sir, give us this bread. Actually, in the translation I read, they said, Always give us this bread. Can you imagine? Close your eyes for a second. And just listen to Jesus' reply. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, 
I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. You can open your eyes. He who comes to me will never be hungry. He who believes in me will never thirst. We're going to enter into a time of communion. It's a ritual that was instituted by Jesus himself just before he was to be crucified. He had a meal with his disciples and he did this meal with them. It's an act symbolizing Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. The cup represents the blood that was shed for our sin. The blood represents his body that was broken so that we might live. It's a symbol. It's a symbol of remembrance. Deacons, I'm going to ask if you all will come on down. Today's passage ends with some of the saddest words in all of Scripture. Because not everyone left believing that day. Not everyone was convinced of Jesus' teachings or Jesus claimed that he was. Some were confused, some were angry, and some were just flat out turned off by the whole thing. He didn't come from heaven. That's Mary and Joseph's boy, they said. Is he really asking for us to eat his body and drink his blood? This teaching is too hard. How can anyone accept it? Those are all comments from that day. It's right there in the text. You can look at it. This morning, you might be asking yourself all of those questions and even more. Your hesitations are understandable, but I have got to tell you that all of your hesitations are just a product of misplaced expectations, which means that ultimately, your motivations are somewhere other than God. And I'm not saying that because you're a horrible person. I'm not. But it doesn't make Jesus' words any less true either. Perhaps you're chasing after food that will spoil while the bread of life is standing there right in front of you. It says that several of the people in the crowd made their choice that day. In fact, the implication is, like, is that most of the people made their choice that day. In John 6, 66. And at this time, many of his disciples turned back. And they no longer followed him. And so I ask, what about you?